YAL is freaking awesome. It's a low-level programming language for blockchain. Like with Solidity, with YAL you can write smart contract on Ethereum. But it's 10 times more difficult. Sounds like a good deal. But wait, I'm serious though. With YAL you can optimize your smart contract code and save some gas. And more importantly, you can show off in front of your colleagues who just use basic Solidity. Ha! Huh, those peasants. So in this video, we are going to rewrite this super simple smart contract in YAL. And it will only take us 15 minutes. Before we start to code, let's talk briefly of the EVM. The EVM or Ethereum Virtual Machine executes smart contract on Ethereum. But the EVM doesn't understand Solidity, which is the main language for smart contract. What? That's right. Before a Solidity smart contract can be executed on the EVM, there are two intermediary steps. First, Solidity is compiled to YAL, which can be considered an intermediary programming language. And after, YAL is compiled to EVM opcodes. These are the basic instructions that the EVM can understand. For example, there are some instructions for basic arithmetic, some instructions to manipulate memory, and there is even a secret instruction to mint infinite ether. But it can only be used by the Ethereum Foundation to finance the salary. No, I'm kidding. But wait a second, why do we even need this weird YAL language? That's because it allows the GigaChat developers like us to produce some very optimized code. With more efficient code, we will consume less gas. And for big DeFi protocols that manipulate hundreds of millions every day, it means we will save millions of dollars in gas fees paid by users. So it's a pretty big deal. Another reason for using YAL is that sometimes there are some EVM opcodes that are not available in Solidity. But in YAL you have access to everything. So you're still a YAL virgin, but we are going to change that. So in my web browser I have loaded Remix. If you've never used Remix before, it's a code editor for Solidity. And I have created a very simple smart contract with an integer variable, a function to change that variable, and a function to read this variable. That's it. So this Solidity smart contract works perfectly fine. And if you just want to stay a mediocre blockchain developer, you can stop watching now. But if you want to become a total GigaChat developer, stay here. Because we are going to put on our GigaBrain and rewrite this smart contract in YAL. In YAL, you start with an object block. Inside the object block, you have a code block. As the name implies, we will put some code there. No kidding, Sherlock. In this code block, we will have the initialization code of our smart contract. In Solidity, that's what we call a constructor. And we also have a nested object block, which will also have its own code block. And in this other code block, this is where we will have the function definitions. Basically, most of the code will be there. So what we have here is an empty smart contract written in YAL. Let's take baby steps here. Before we write more code, can we even deploy that? No, we can't. But if you use Solidity, it's completely possible to deploy an empty smart contract. So why can we do the same thing with YAL? Well, that's because Solidity is an illusion. It makes it look easy. But behind the hood, it does a lot of things for you. And one of the things it does is to create the init code. The init code is executed only once when you deploy a smart contract. It corresponds to the constructor in Solidity. This is where you initialize some values. And at the end of the init code, it's going to tell the EVM what is the actual code of the smart contract, also called the runtime code. But in YAL, this init code isn't created automatically. We need to create it ourselves. And it looks like this. Whoa, it doesn't look very beginner friendly. Don't worry, we will go line by line. We first get the size of the runtime code and we put it in a local variable. We then get the offset of the runtime code. Okay, but offset relative to what? Good question. The init code and the runtime code are concatenated and put in the data field of the deployment transaction. And we can target any part of the data field by using its relative offset from the beginning in bytes. All right, so once we have the offset of the runtime code, we are going to copy it into memory. Which memory? Is it on the blockchain? Nope. In the EVM, there are several types of data location. Memory is a transient data storage. It exists only during the execution of a transaction. Okay, but what is the meaning of all these arguments? The first argument is where you copy to. Here that means that we copy to the memory offset 0, which means the beginning of the memory. And after we specify what we copy. We copy starting from the offset of the runtime code and we copy the whole length of the code. Okay, we are almost there. The runtime code has been copied to memory. But for the EVM, what is in memory doesn't mean anything. We need to explicitly tell the EVM, hey, this part of the memory is the runtime code. And this is what we do in this line of code with the written statement. We start at the memory offset 0, then we specify the length, 
And that's it. We have created the init code. After this written statement, the runtime code is saved in the blockchain. And now our smart contract is deployable. So congrats, you have just learned how to code a YOL smart contract that doesn't do anything at all. And now let's learn how to code something useful. So in the runtime code, we are going to add our first function, the retrieve function. Its job is to read the value of an integer variable. So in the YOL version of this function, like in Solidity, we have the function name, parenthesis. However, after the syntax is a bit different. We declare the name of the variable that will be returned, but not its type contrary to Solidity. Okay, but why do we have this weird name memlock? The first reason is that it makes me look smarter when my code looks very complex. And the second reason is that it means memory location. We are going to return a memory location that points to our data. More on that later. We first get the value of our variable. And for that, we use the sload opcode, which loads data from the smart contract storage. That's a long-term storage stored in the blockchain. Slot number? What's that? To understand that, we need to talk of the EVM. I told you before that the EVM has different data location. There is the memory for temporary data, and we also have the storage, which is long-term. Both the memory and the storage are divided into slots of 256 bits. To target a specific slot, you specify the offset from the beginning. Slot 0 is the first slot, slot 1 is the second slot, etc. Exactly like you would do with a zero index array. But wait a second, how did we know that our variable was at slot 0? At the EVM level, there are no variables, just memory slots. Even though Solidity allows us to define variables with human readable names, it's only to help us. Internally, Solidity maps these variables to memory slots. And it does it in a very logical way. The first variable declared in a smart contract will take the first memory slot. The second variable will take the second memory slot, etc. There are more complex rules for arrays and other data types, but let's not get there. You will see this when you are a Jedi GigaChad. Now you are just a Padawan GigaChad. So to make it easy, we will just follow the convention of solidity and decide that our variable occupy the first slot. And once we get this value, we assign it to a local variable. Then we declare a pointer and initialize it to zero. A pointer? I'm really scared. But don't worry, if it looks complex, it's because it really is. A pointer is the address of a memory location, but it's not the data itself. You can compare this to a URL. It points to a website, but it's not the website itself. Technically, a pointer represents an offset of memory slot. So here we assign this pointer to the first memory slot. And in the last line of the function, we copy our local variable to the memory location referenced by the pointer. So for example, if the value that we retrieve is 10, the memory slot zero will contain the value 10. Okay, so we have re-implemented the retrieve function. Nice job! But we still have the other function to do, store. It just accepts an argument and store it on the blockchain. So now let's do the same code in YOL. And it's super simple. We use the ssstore opcode to store the data in the first storage slot. Remember, slot numbers are completely arbitrary. We could have picked any other storage slot. We just need to be consistent with the slot that we picked in the retrieve function. That's it. So are we done? It looks like it. So I deploy the contract and I try to interact with it. But unfortunately, it didn't work. Every time I sent a transaction, there was an error. God damn it! What did we do wrong? Okay, so it turns out that smart contracts don't quite work the way you think they work. In Solidity, we can group our code into different functions. But at the EVM level, there is just one giant function. Every time you call a smart contract, no matter which function you execute, it always executes the same giant function. But wait a minute, it's possible to call a specific function in a smart contract, right? But if we have only one function at the EVM level, how does it work? Good question. In a transaction, there is the data field where we specify which function to call and with which arguments. So internally, Solidity pass this data field, figure out which function was called and dispatch the call to the correct function. But Yield doesn't do this. We need to tell it everything, even how to execute a function. So now back in our code, above our function definition, we need to add this switch case statement. Here the selector function is a utility function that extracts the function selector from the data field of the transaction. We will implement this function later, but for now let's just assume that it works. But how function selectors work? A function selector is a unique hexadecimal string that identifies a function. There are two steps to create a function selector. First, you create a cryptographic hash of the function signature. Then you take the first four bytes. This is the function selector for the retrieve function. And this is the function selector for the store function. 
And finally, there is one last block in our switch case statement in case we cannot match any of the function selectors. If we ever reach this block, the transaction is cancelled with a revert. If you already used Solidity before, I'm sure you can see the similarity with the fallback function. Ok, so are we done with function selectors? Almost. There is one last detail, the selector function. This will extract the function selector from the data field of the transaction. So this function looks like this. It returns the variable s. With the call data load opcode, we get a 30 bytes word of the data field of the transaction at position n. So here, call data load of 0 gets us the first 30 bytes of the data field. However, we are only interested in the first 4 bytes. We are going to need some byte manipulation tricks. Specifically, we are going to use an opcode called SHR for shift right. With shift right, we can, well, you guessed it, shift the bits to the right. So if we shift enough bits, we get rid of all the bits that we don't care. And we only keep the first 4 bytes. How many bits do we need to shift? There are 256 bits total. We need the first 4 bytes, which means the first 30 bits. 256 minus 32 equals 224, so we need to shift 224 bits. And that is what this code does. Ok, let's stop here for a second. Alright, so we are able to dispatch the execution flow to the correct function. Bravo! Next, we just need to connect our switch case statement to our two function. Here is retrieve, the function to read our variable. We first get the memory location where the result is stored. Then we return 30 bytes of memory, starting at the location that we got from the retrieve function. In case you wonder why 30 bytes, it's because 30 bytes is equal to 256 bits and it's also the length of an integer variable in Solidity. Ok, we are almost done. We just have one last function. Store, the function to update our variable. We only need to get the argument and pass it to the store function. And we will read this from the data field coming from the transaction. So in Solidity, the convention is to put first the function selector for the first 4 bytes and after the arguments of the function. But this is just a convention and the EVM doesn't care at all. But we're gonna keep this convention. And we can leverage the call data load opcode to get the data field of the transaction. Call data load read the data field by slot of 256 bits. And we need the fifth slot where we have the integer argument. The memory slot start at 0, so for the fifth slot it's position 4. And we pass this to the store function. Ok, but does it work? Maybe I'm just scamming you. I just pretend to be smart, but it doesn't work at all. I've thought about this. And this is why I've tested my smart contract. I wrote a small script where I deploy the contract, I store a value with the store function, and then I make sure that we can read this value with the retrieve function. And now the moment of truth, does it work? Let me run the script and yes, it works! Congrats! But congrats to who? Congrats to myself first? And congrats to you as well for following up up to here. Yes, because now you are not a YOL virgin anymore. You belong to the very exclusive elite of blockchain developers who code directly with EVM upcodes. And it's not just for showing off. YOL is used by some of the biggest blockchain projects for gas savings. If you can put this on your CV, it's gonna make you stand out. Oh, one last thing. If you want to learn how you can get your first job in Web3, check out my free masterclass. I'm going to give you a full roadmap from start to finish. The link is down below and it's completely free. Alright, see you next time, bye!